So thank you, and um, thanks for the invitation to come up here and speak. It's great to come and, um, and talk to some folks who are excited about geology. I share this excitement. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in an earth sciences department as a paleontologist, and my work um, is sort of somewhere in between biology and, and earth science. And so um, I'm going to talk about some of the interfaces between the two. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the paleontology. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the evolution of the landscape and maybe some of the ways in which those two, the, the fauna and the landscape interact over time. Um, I'll also say that um, I have rewritten this talk from one I gave to a sort of professional geologist audience. And so if at some point I say something and it doesn't make sense, I'm just fine with like hands or whatever. If you need me to stop and, and explain, I can. I don't want to get completely derailed. But if I if I do something that that you're not following, then um, either feel free to, to pause me if you just want me to, to define a term or something like that. Um, or you know you can also save questions for the end if you want me to go into more depth about things I can I can come back and explain them. So let me know how we're doing. I'm gonna we're, we'll see if I've uh, hit the audience right. Um, so um, so I'm gonna talk about the coevolution of landscape and terrestrial mammals over 30 million years of Oregon's geologic history. Just just a little bit. Okay. Um, so I am uh, I am a mammal paleontologist. I work on mammals. I work all uh, all across the mammalian tree, um, anything that was furry or descended from something furry, I probably uh, have played with it at some point. Um, and just to give you guys a, a, you know, sort of a reminder of what we're talking about when I'm talking about fossil mammals, um, I'm talking about, you know, the, the extant things and all of their buddies. So over there on the, the left side of the screen, you can see the, um, some of the diversity of living mammals, um, but also some of the wonderful things that we know um, from the fossil record. Some of the, the, the things that really excite me about um, paleontology actually are, um, oops, um, are a lot of these animals that are not really like anything we have alive today. Um, actually, this guy in, in the bottom center of the slide here uh, with the horns that, that's in the hole there, this is a thing called Ceratogallus, and this is the mammal that I love best of all of them. <laughs> Anything that lives in a hole and has giant horns on its face is clearly <laughs> like we got to understand what that's doing, right? So th this is what motivates me is trying to understand um, history of evolution of mammals, um, why they evolved the way they did, why we have so many kinds of mammals, and why we've had so many kinds of mammals that aren't alive today. Okay, I'm really excited about these things. I do not work on dinosaurs, so if you're here for the dinosaur show, I'm sorry, the door's not there. Okay. Um, so. <clears throat> One of the questions I'm really excited about because I'm interested in, in you know, how we get all these different kinds of mammals and where they came from um, is I'm trying to understand how habitat drives mammalian evolution, right? So how do changes in the landscape and the habitat that mammals experience affect the ecology and the evolution of this, um, this group, right? And so I've looked at this in a lot of different ways. I've looked at, at you know, problems of climate change and things like that. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate, but I'm also going to think about um, some, some structural changes in the habitat and some ways in which the geology really interacts um, in generating these kind of habitat mammal um, relationships. Um, so hopefully, um, actually, it's totally possible that you've never seen this before. If you've never seen this curve before, Welcome to the last 65 million years of climate change. Okay, um, you are here over on the right. Um, and I might see if I can scoot this over just a little bit more so that we can see what's going on. There we go. Um, so uh, this is, um, here I'll use a pointer so those of you in Zoom land can see it too. So, uh, you know, over here on the, the right hand side is the present, so zero million years ago. Okay, and as you go, over to the left, it gets a longer and longer time ago. And um, those of you who are familiar with your geologic time will remember that you know, 65 million years here is about the time when the, um, the large object whacked the earth and kind of drove the extinction of dinosaurs, right? So this is basically the age of mammals here, right? And I've given you um, a squiggly line that um, shows you something about what climate has been doing um, in that time, okay? It's uh, based on a proxy, um, that is 
uh, the isotopic composition of little tiny organisms from the seafloor. Turns out they um, correlate very tightly with temperature. And so we can say, what has temperature been doing for the last 65 million years? Because this is gonna be really important if you're gonna think about how habitat has shaped mammal evolution. You know, climate is a big part of what shapes habitat, okay? So what has climate been doing for the last 65 million years? Okay, when this line is high, when it's, when it's up, then it's warm, and when it's down, then it's cold. And so we're used to thinking about right now, you know, global climate change, global warming, this is a thing, it's real, right? Okay, that is totally true. However, relative to the last 65 million years, we're in a very cold time period, okay? It's been a whole lot warmer in the last 65 million years, and it's pretty cold right now, okay? Um, and so when we think about the history of mammalian evolution, um, and we think about how climate change might have shaped that history, we have to be aware of this context that, you know, after dinosaurs went extinct, it was pretty warm. And then it got even warmer. It got really quite warm in this period of time, about 50 million years ago in the Eocene. And then since then, it's pretty much been cooling off. Okay, so that has some major implications for what habitat does um, through that period of time. Okay, so, so just, just have that in your head that, you know, dinosaurs went extinct, it was quite warm, it cooled off, um, not quite, you know, monotonically, it goes down a little bit and then it flattens out and it goes down a little bit and it flattens out all the way to now, okay? So, um, so what does that mean for, um, for what habitat is doing? Well, if you look back in the Paleocene and Eocene, that is in those time periods right after the dinosaurs went extinct, most of the globe shows evidence of forests, okay? So, um, you know, we had the picture of Long Hancock up here, Hancock Mammal Quarry out in um, Central Oregon is of this age, it's sort of late Eocene, right? So it's in the relatively warm time. And if you go out to, um, to the Clarno, the uh, Clarno fossil beds where Hancock had his ranch, um, there's a bed that has some really spectacularly preserved plants called the, um, the Clarno nut beds, right? Um, and that uh, deposit shows us something about what the plants look like at this time back in the, in the Eocene. Um, and just to give you a sense of this, think about what Central Oregon looks like plant-wise today. Okay, envision this in your head. All right, and now understand that in the Clarno nut beds, there are fossil bananas. All right, kind of says what you need to know, okay? Bananas, warm, humid, forested habitats, right? Not really out there in a sagebrush scrub, okay? So really dramatically different kinds of vegetation. And as a consequence, the animals in that landscape are also gonna be pretty dramatically different, okay? They're experiencing some really different conditions. So extinction of dinosaurs, mammals in these beautiful, warm, forested, humid environments. And then remember I said, things get colder from there on, right? Um, what does that mean for habitat? Well, when things get colder on a global scale, they also generally get drier, okay? The warmer it is, the more it vaporizes water out of the ocean, okay? And that um, brings more water up into the water cycle, right? Um, it means there's more rain, right? Rains out, evaporates again, you know, general cycling of water all the time. It's more humid when it's warmer. When it's colder, it gets drier, okay? What does that do? Well, as you go from the Eocene into a time period we call the Oligocene, which is sort of like the middle of the last 65 million years, so right around 30 million, it gets pretty dry. Okay, it gets pretty cold, and it gets pretty dry, and you start to see um, more open habitats. So not so much closed forest, more open habitats. And that's what this graph is showing. I know it's a tiny little thing, so I'm gonna explain what you're looking at here. Um, so this is based on some work that Carolyn Stromberg at the University of Washington did. Um, she actually started this work when we were in grad school together. Um, and it's 
like such cool stuff. She's figured out a way to get plant data from the same dirt we get the fossil mammals preserved in. Um, it's kind of challenging because plants generally preserve in very different sort of conditions from uh, fossil vertebrates. So fossil vertebrates are made out of calcium phosphate. They dissolve in acid, but they preserve very well in a basic soil. Plants, fossil plants, deserve, dissolve in a basic environment and are preserved best in acidic environments. So crap, you can't get plants and, and vertebrates together. Except Carolyn figured out that there are these little bodies of silica, of you know, silicon dioxide um, in the plant's structure. And you can identify what kind of plant they came out of based on their shape. And so she took the sediment from like literally around the fossils, you know, she'd go into a jacket full of fossils and like scrape some of the sediment out and then concentrate these little plant silica bodies out of it and say, what was the habitat this thing was dead in, right? This thing died and was buried in sediment. What are the plants like there? Um, and if you look at the plants um, through time, so the bottom of this uh, column here is the Eocene. Like I said, this is that time when we had, you know, forested environments um, and now is up here on the top, okay? Um, and this graph basically shows you, um, actually, we'll use this middle column here. This is what proportion of these little phytoliths, these little grass, or these little um, silica bodies from inside the plants, what proportion of them come from grasses, okay? Because if you have an open habitat, we usually think grasses, right? There's gonna be more, uh, grassy plants. And if you look back in the Eocene, like I said, it's forested and it's zero grass. There is no grass. Grass existed then. We have fossils of grasses from the Eocene in Europe. Um, so we know they were around. They just weren't everywhere like they are today, right? But if you look through time, as you get closer to current time, you see this period between about this is 25 million here, 25 million years ago, and about 20 million years ago, you go from almost no grass to suddenly lots of grass, okay? So as things cool through the last 30 million years, there's that point right around 30 million years ago where suddenly open habitats take off, okay? And um, you see, this increasing abundance through time, right? So more and more, you can see some of these habitats still 20 million years ago. Some of them are very low grass. Each of these points is like one place, right? And some of them are, have a lot of grass. Okay, so there's some variety for a while there, but then you get close to now and you can see even the ones that don't have a lot of grass still are 20% grass, right? So like there's still quite a bit of grass in those assemblages, right? And most of the assemblages are mostly grass. So as time goes on, more and more of the habitats are open. More and more of them are grassy. And late in the Miocene, this little orange bit here, um, you see the spread of what we call C4 grasses, which are open habitat like seasonal grasses like we see in the Great Plains today. So the native grasses out there now are these C4 grasses that are really drought tolerant. Okay, so you can see the flora says habitats are getting more open, getting drier, okay. So, so this is, you know, this is the story that we know about habitat change through um, the last 30 million years. It's kind of neat, because if you go from forest to grassland, you can expect that things might be really quite different for the, the animals living there. Um, and, and this is something that we've known a lot about too. This is a graph from a paper in year 2000, this is a 22 year old graph, like who cares, right? We've known this for a long time. We've known that the way that a lot of the herbivores, the, the herbivorous mammals in the ecosystems respond is by evolving teeth that can resist abrasion. Turns out if you live in an open habitat, um, you get a lot of grit in your diet, right? The grit blows around, gets on the plants and, um, makes them abrade your teeth. So there's some little pictures just to illustrate what this looks like. Okay, so here's a low crown tooth kind of like yours, right? It's got big roots and a little tooth crown, not very big. Um, but over time, when you have a dry habitat, you get taller and taller tooth crowns, okay? So you can see 
um, that, that you go from sort of low crowned to what we call mesodont or higher crowned. Um, eventually we get hypsodont, which is high crown. This is like horses. Okay, horses have these really high crown teeth. Um, and then there are some things, especially rodents, which are my favorites, um, that have these teeth that are so high crown, they never actually close their tooth roots. So they just grow their teeth throughout their lives, right? You've seen um, probably, you know, like baby teeth without roots, right? The roots are dissolved out of the, the, the tooth by the new tooth coming in. Um, these guys just never make roots in their teeth. They've just got as much tooth as they want to resist abrasion, okay? So this is a pattern we've seen in a lot of mammals and you can kind of see this um, here. This is just uh, a, basically a survey over time. Okay, so here's now, there's a long time ago. See, my axis goes the same way as the last one. It's always good. Um, back to 25 million years ago. And you can see um, that 25 million years ago, most of the taxa, most of the species we have in assemblages were brachydont, right? Low crowned, right? That's what this B is for, right? So most of them were brachydont back then. And then there were just a few that had these high crown teeth, the hypsodont teeth, right? And as these habitats get grassier and grassier over the last 30 million years, you see more of these higher crown teeth added. So more mesodont ones here, these M, and more hypsodont ones. Okay, but the brachydont ones don't go away right away, right? They're hanging out where the trees are. They're, they're still eating the same stuff they were before. And then as it gets more and more open, these things that don't have abrasion resistant teeth are just lost from ecosystems. And we have changed from, you know, squirrely things that have, you know, teeth that are good at eating food in a forest to, you know, things that like voles, things like um, kangaroo rats um, that are better at eating more abrasive foods in an open grassland. In this case, this is, um, you know, the story from ungulates. So it's, you know, horses versus deer, right? Deer have low crown teeth. They're better at eating leaves off of trees. Horses can eat grass and they'll just eat everything and, and their teeth get abraded and that's fine, right? So, so this is a story we've known, okay? So why am, I, why am I telling this story? Well, one of the things that's interesting about this is, is much of what we know about the relationship between habitat and mammal ecology is from the Great Plains, okay? So these are studies in Nebraska and Kansas and Texas and Oklahoma, which are lovely places, okay? But, but all of these papers, these are, these are front pages from a bunch of papers about the spread of grasslands and the evolution of mammals in the context of the spread of grasslands. Every one of these papers is based on data from the Great Plains. Okay, but you know, today, if you go to Nebraska, or Kansas or Oklahoma, it doesn't really look like it does in Oregon, for example. And so these papers will tell us about, you know, the transition to open habitat grasses in North America in the last 30 million years. And they'll tell you all about how this is what happens in North America. Thing is, it's not actually what happens in all of North America. It's what happens in the Great Plains, okay? So I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I got a chip on my shoulder about this, but I had to ask the question, okay, we know this from the Great Plains, but is it like that everywhere, right? Like we know today there are open habitats in Oregon, okay? But they don't really look like the open habitats in Kansas. So do the, the animals do the same thing? The other thing that we have to think about um, that makes Oregon quite different from Kansas and Nebraska and places like that um, is tectonic activity. So if you've spent any time in Kansas or Nebraska, you know they're not spending a whole lot of time worrying about earthquakes, right? They're not really contemplating volcanic eruptions sort of running through their yards, right? They, they do not live on the side of a volcano like many of us do, right? Um, and, and it's kind of flat. Right? You might have noticed you can see an awfully long way when you stand in your front yard in Kansas. Okay. Um, and these are just a couple of maps of sort of various ways of looking at the topography, right? Um, and what you can see is there's sort of a there's kind of a boundary here, right? Like right around the sort of 
eastern side of Colorado here, you know, you get to the, the edge of the four corners there and it gets a whole lot flatter, right? And everything west of there is tectonically active, right? We've had the, the Rockies uplifted. We've had, um, you know, volcanoes cruising across the, the Yellowstone hotspot, you know, making um, volcanic eruptions all the way to Montana and so forth, right? Um, and of course here on the West Coast, we know all about tectonic activity. Thank you very much. We, we live, you know, on the edge of a subduction zone, right? So, um, so that's interesting. That might actually do something to this relationship between mammals and habitat, right? Because if it's not just a flat grassland, if it's a topographically complex landscape, there might be some other processes at work here. So, so this is something that um, a colleague of mine um, sort of began investigating uh, a little over a decade ago, um, looking at how the process of evolution of mammals might be different in the tectonically active part of the, the North America relative to this mid-continent that has dominated so much of our understanding of the relationship between habitat and mammals. Um, and you know, one of her thoughts was, you know, as tectonic activity happens, maybe you might see a pulse of diversification because we have greater diversity on the tectonically active part of the, the continent now than we do in the Great Plains, maybe, you know, you get mountain building, it like separates one group of mammals from another and um, and you get speciation and evolution and, and different habitats and that kind of thing, right? Well, yeah, you know, interesting idea. What would happen if you add tectonics into this equation instead of just looking at grass showing up on a flat plain as it dries out, right? Um, and I'm gonna kind of add a dimension to this. Um, I mentioned that I like rodents better than anything else, right? Um, I'm going to say that that really, if we want to ask this question about how tectonic activity affects the picture, how it um, how it might shape this relationship between mammals and climate, small mammals are the place to go. And the reason why is really well illustrated by my friend the marmot here. Um, behold him sitting on a rock, right? Um, these guys don't really get around a lot, okay? If you wanna look at local effects at how things might be different, um, the small mammals are gonna be the first things that are gonna tell you something about that, right? Because they're the ones that are um, experiencing a very small piece of the landscape, right? If you have big grazing ungulates that are gonna wander across the landscape, right? Deer and um, elk and things like that, they're covering you know, kilometers in a day, okay? So what's going on here? And what's going on in the next valley? Man, they're gonna see it, all of it in, in the next week, it's fine, right? Um, the small mammals might live their entire lives in a square kilometer or less, okay? There's some of these guys that don't go anywhere. And so if you wanna know what's going on locally, you really wanna start with the little things, right? Because they're just gonna experience the very local habitat. So I made that argument um, a number of years ago um, and a friend of mine and I, uh, Josh Samuels, put together a bunch of the data on mammals. Um, and we said, the small mammals are gonna be the first ones to experience a change in habitat. They're gonna do it first because they have to adapt locally. Um, and we use that to make the argument. Remember that graph of the tooth crown height in the, in the ungulates that I showed you earlier from 2000? We said, I bet it's gonna look different in the small mammals. I bet they're gonna do it differently. And they do. So if you look at the same thing, here's the crown height again. Okay, break it out of the, of the bottom, okay? In this case, I've done it just as a proportion rather than as total numbers. Um, I have the total numbers, but it's a different graph. It's harder to look at. Um, so the low crown things are here at the bottom. Here's mesodont, right? The, the sort of middle height teeth again. Here's hypsodont, and these are the ones who also get those teeth with no roots at all. And what I want you to notice is when that change happens, because remember before, at about 25 million years ago was when you saw the change start to happen in the, in the herbivore ungulates, right? And if you look at um, the small mammals, you can see this change start to happen around 40 million years ago. We start to pick up our mesodont and hypsodont mammals. They're doing it earlier. And now we're gonna think back to that graph of the changes in the plants 
I know, I'm sorry, I'm making you pull back things that we talked about solidly 10 minutes ago, okay? But the plants, remember, started changing back 30 million years ago and a little bit more, right? You first saw the grassy habitats pick up well before the big ungulates responded to them. So here's my small mammals. They found the grass and they're eating it. Okay, so they're there firstest with the mostest. We've got a reason to believe that the small mammals might be more sensitive to what's going on in the habitat than the large mammals. It's great to be right, right? It's the best feeling. Okay, so, so we have a reason to think that not only do we need to look at tectonically active areas, but we should probably look at the little things in those tectonically active areas if we wanna get a really sensitive idea of how the local habitat shapes stuff. Okay, um, and there's a couple of ways in which we expect that these tectonically active um, environments might be um, different. One of them is that when you have a tectonically active environment, whether it's volcanoes or earthquakes making you know, fault movement, you get mountains, right? You get big um, barriers to migration, okay? You get a mountain range, Little mammals are not gonna be able to just go over the hill necessarily. It's a long way around. Okay, so you get populations separated where on this you know, more uniform kind of flat plain, they can just kind of wander around wherever they're probably connected with all the other ones. You know, The ones that live down in this valley are probably not making friends with the ones on the other side of this mountain range, okay? So barriers to migration offer a possible way that you could get greater diversity of small mammals as a result of tectonics. So that's kind of cool. The other thing is that in a tectonically active environment, you have a greater diversity of actual habitats, of micro habitats, of physical environments, okay? So there's, you know, down in the valley, it's kind of, you know, moister and it's gonna be maybe um, a little more forested close to the streams. And then on the side of the hill, you get, you know, on the, the windward side, you get, more moisture and you're gonna get sort of one set of plants, right? And then up at the top of the hill, it's gonna be, you know, really dry and cold. And so then you're gonna another set of plants. And then on the other side of the mountain range, of course, it looks different, right? Everybody's driven from, you know, here to bend has seen how it changes as you go over the cascades, right? You know, so, so you're also gonna get a greater diversity of habitats in a tectonically active environment. That's interesting. That should make a bigger difference to the diversity of the mammals too, okay? So sitting there in the Great Plains, just looking at that fauna may not get you the whole story. And the, the really cool thing about it um, is that, you know, the Great Plains is gonna get a certain number of species that just sort of like, wander down out of the mountains and are like, oh, this is cool, you know? So half of what's going on in the Great Plains may actually be happening evolutionarily in the tectonically active areas, not there. They're just borrowing our species, right? <laughs> so, um, so this is a problem that I'm really interested in. This is when we don't know, you know, what's the importance of differences in habitats versus barriers to migration, right? This is something we're really looking at actively, okay? So this is a problem I'm, I'm excited about. I don't have the answer to yet. Um, this is my grad student, Amanda Peng. Um, she's actually working actively on um, some of these problems with me. So she's got a really clever study looking at um, the relationship between diversity, that is like number of different species of things, um, and disparity, that is how different those things are. Um, and I probably don't have time, no, I definitely don't have time to go into the reasons why um, this is true, but depending on whether the diversity of habitats is more important or the barriers to migration are more important to generating that diversity in tectonically active environments, um, it has different predictions for what dis disparity you know, the, the difference between things should do relative to diversity, the number of different kinds of things, okay? Um, so she's doing a really cool project looking at, at um, you know, different habitats to see how this works. Um, you know, she has some kind of fun uh, preliminary data, you know, demonstrating um, that basically diversity and disparity are doing two totally different things. So you can't even just look at the number of species out there. You also have to look at how different they are in order to understand how these um, habitats come about. I apologize for sticking your graph up, but I'm really not explaining adequately. Um, I want to get pretty pictures of fossils also. Um, so um, 
So how do we test these ideas about how diversity in, um, how diversity evolves in a tectonically active landscape? Well, let's think about what we need in a fossil record to do this, okay? We need a good continuous mammal fossil record so we can see it change through time, right? We need to see how this changes as habitats evolve, as the landscape goes up. Um, we also need a place with a really well-studied an extensive history of the tectonic activity. We gotta know what's going on tectonically in order to tie that tectonic activity to the evolution of the mammals there. Guess what we have in Oregon? Okay, we have a really well understood tectonic history. Okay, here's our geologic map of Oregon, right? We've um, probably, you guys have all seen this. If not, it's freely available, courtesy of Dogami, the um, uh, Department of geology, mining, and minerals. minerals, and yeah, there you go. Okay, I can never remember the acronym. Um, so um, one of the things you can see when you look at the geologic map of Oregon is all of the volcanoes. Oh my goodness, right? You can also see all of these faults, these little lines here. These are, you know, faults that have in the past or are currently, um, you know, moving, right? And, and um, you know, engaging in tectonic activity, right? Um, and, you know, here's just a sense of through time, you know, since the extinction of the dinosaurs, some of the major, like, tectonic events in the history of Oregon. What I want you to get from this is that there's a lot of them, right? We know them very well. We know when they happened. We know where they happened. And so we can really tie that tectonic activity um, to particular points uh, in, uh, in space and time. And then we have 150 years of vertebrate paleontology in Oregon. Okay, so um, Thomas Condon here was the first vertebrate, or, sorry, the first science professor at the University of Oregon. He was a, a paleontologist. Um, this is uh, John C. Miriam at uh, the University of California um, who collected the Oregon record pretty extensively. He heard from Condon about how there are these crazy cool fossils out in John Day. And Miriam was one of the people who really developed the, the John Day record. Um, that collection is down at Berkeley. And um, I, have, I have held specimens that this man collected over a hundred years ago, which is kind of neat. Um, sort of a fun experience. Um, this guy, Chester Stock, was a professor down at the uh, Caltech, which at the time had a paleontology program. Um, he was responsible for finding a whole lot of the localities we know in Southeast Oregon. So way out in the big empty in, you know, um, the area around um, Beatty's Butte and French Glen and so forth. There's some sites out there and out in the Owyhee. Um, a lot of those are sites that he um, collected really extensively. He was also one of the first people to collect for small mammals out there. So he would actually like screen wash. He'd go out with a you know, window screen and run the sediment through the screen and find the little tiny fossils that way. Um, so, uh, so he built a lot of that record. Um, this guy in the middle, Arnold Shotwell, um, was uh, again a geologist at the University of Oregon. Um, and uh, he did a lot of work in um, in Eastern Oregon around the Waihee area. He also was one of the people that advocated for making John Day fossil beds uh, a national monument. Um, and so he's one of the reasons why that's been preserved for the last several decades. Um, and then um, I have to put my friend, Ted Friend up here. Um, Ted's been the, uh, Ted was the head paleontologist at John Day for uh, many years. Um, and collected just a phenomenal record out there. If you've ever been out to the John Day fossil beds and seen the Condon Paleontology Center, um, a lot of the material there was collected while Ted was the, the paleo head paleontologist. So among all of these folks, we have these collections at um, Oregon and at UC Berkeley and at uh, Caltech, which are those things now at the LA County Museum, um, and then at the John Day fossil beds, 150 years of people just picking up the fossils they could find, okay? Which means we know the record pretty darn well, okay? So what a great place to do this. Good record, great tectonic history. We got this, right? Um, I'm gonna skip this because I'm running slow today. Um, in short, if we start looking at this record, we find that the patterns in the Great Plains and the Northwest are not the same. So this top bar, these are the same things. So these are some ecological categories plotted for the Northwest and the Great Plains, right? We took the records that we know from these two areas and we said, do they do the same thing? All I want you to do is squint at these and tell me 
when you look at the top one and the bottom one, the Northwest and the Great Plains, do the changes seem to be the same? Do they happen at the same time? Kind of not so much, okay? It's pretty different. We got to look at the Northwest. We can't just make this generalization based on the Great Plains. That is not enough, right? Surprise, it's different when it's an active landscape. It's different in a different place. In order to understand the history of habitat change and the relationship between mammals and the changes in habitat, we have to be able to look at the record in the Northwest, okay? So there's some major differences in their teeth, right? The one on the left is the tooth crown height again, okay? And you can see the patterns of abundance of different sort of tooth crown categories are quite different um, between the Northwest and, um, and the Great Plains. The Northwest actually um, has more high crown teeth early. It's probably drier and more open early in time. Um, and then it sort of changes back and forth through time, which is kind of interesting. Whereas in the Great Plains, you get this much more directional thing, just like you saw in the in the big mammals. Okay. And if we look at the way things get around, this is like, you know, do they dig holes? Do they climb trees and all that kind of thing? Um, you see some really dramatically different patterns in, in the way that things get around. You see um, greater abundances of um, things that like open habitats in uh, in the the Northwest yet again. Okay, so so that's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, we're doing this with a kind of sparse record. Okay, so this is just to show you the numbers on this. So um, in this left-hand graph, you can just say see through time from a long time ago to relatively recently. So left to right as before. Um, the Great Plains is this red bar. They have lots and lots of sites or lots of formations, lots of different geologic units from each time period to get their, their data on. We have fewer in the Northwest that we know. Okay, and if you look at the number of sites where we've collected fossil mammals, small mammals, okay, left-hand bar is the Great Plains, right-hand bar is the Northwest. Mm, clearly people have spent more time collecting fossils in the Great Plains than the Northwest, okay? So every time period here, except this last one, you know, the Northwest is about equal here in late in time, um, but especially, you know, early in time, there's a need to fill this earlier, these earlier time periods to, to get a record in the Northwest that's comparable, okay? Um, that said, there's plenty of places where you can find fossils in the Northwest. Okay, this is just a graph of um, you know fossil sites known with published fossils in them in Oregon. And basically, what you could say is everywhere that people have done a lot of looking, there's fossils. I will tell you that out here, where it looks like there's not very many fossils, that's because nobody's looked in most of these places. Okay, <laughs> I've been out here. I was out. There this summer, there are fossils there. Okay, I was out here a couple of years ago. There are fossils there too, right? They're all over the place. Yeah. Will you speak to what specific animals were found? I will. I love how you set me up. Look at that. <laughs> I feel like I knew it. I'll pay you later. Um, it's a great question. Okay, so so we're doing this. Okay, we're out there looking for more fossils to fill these gaps. Okay, um, and this name, this late Heming Fordian, is the name of the time period where those bars were just really low. We're looking for sites of those ages in order to fill those gaps. And what have we what have we found when we go out there? It turns out there's a lot of unknown fossils out there that are filling the gaps that are telling us something about the diversity um, of this record. So um, this is a site called Hawk Rim. Um, it was a master's thesis site for um, one of my former students, Wynn McLaughlin. Um, and just some of the things that we described from there. We have, you know, a nice big assemblage. We've got, you know, several cabinets full of fossils from there. Um, but here is, um, this is a little guy, Wate um, Tabutsugui, which is a, um, a grisson, a close relative of wolverine. So you can see this is a nice, it's not a nice jaw, but it's it's a jaw. It's got some teeth, right? It's a little, it's a little busted. Um, but um, this is cool. This is a new genus a new total variety of uh, this wolverine relative. Um, here's this thing, Cryptylurus. It's a sort of little weasley 
uh, creature um, from the same site. We just described this a couple of years ago um, with a, another of my students, Paul Barrett. Um, so, you know, you can see we're getting some really spectacular little, um, little carnivores out of here, right? These are, these are carnivorous mammals. Okay, we've got another, um, another site, Coglin Buttes. This was a master's thesis for uh, my former student, Kristen McKenzie. Um, she was a, a former um, hotshot firefighter and came back to school to do her graduate work in paleontology. And she found this site herself and, um, and uncovered some of the material from there. And you can see just spectacular big mammals. Okay, I gotta admit, this is not a small thing. Okay, but um, this is a big camel skull. So here's the teeth, to the back of the head there. Here's the little front teeth, okay. Um, we have a bunch more of these from this site. We're still working on preparing all of them. So, um, you know, this is a big thing called Os Osbornodon. It's a big um, sort of uh, dog relative that's, it's not like, it's a lot chunkier than a modern dog, okay. Make, it's more of your, your uh, St. Bernard style dog rather than a like, wolf or something like that. Um, so, you know, new occurrences that we didn't know about in Oregon here. Um, and then we've got this site that I love that maybe not everyone would call, uh, called Cave Basin, um, where we're getting really spectacular tiny mammals and we're screen washing out just piles and piles of tiny mammals. And so all of these, everything you see up here is an individual specimen that we found in the course of the work we're trying to do to build the small mammal record in particular. So these are a bunch of squirrel teeth that were described by an undergraduate who worked in my lab. Um, had another undergraduate who was working on um, moles and shrews and things like that and describing, um, this is a humerus, an arm bone from a, um, an early mole. Um, here's some little jaws of a shrew here. And then this is um, this thing called herpetotherium. This is actually an, a marsupial. It's descended from the marsupials that lived with the dinosaurs. This is in no way related to the modern opossum, which came in much later from South America after North and South America docked up. So this is like this, you know, leftover from the age of the dinosaurs. And we found this is the last occurrence of marsupials in North America hanging about in, you know, central Oregon, just doing its thing with its friends, the shrews and the moles, okay? So going out there and collecting these things with a deliberate eye towards building the small mammal record um, is giving us a lot more diversity of these things and, and eventually will give us the data that we need um, to figure out how tectonics relates to diversification. So, um, so Oregon has the record to answer these questions about how tectonics shapes diversification, um, but we've got more work to do to fill these gaps. This record, as I showed you, is really kind of um, kind of gappy. So I apologize for giving you a sort of stay tuned answer, right? We've got some really nice fossils coming out. It's gonna take us a while longer before we can really answer the evolutionary questions about how these changes in habitat have shaped um, the, the evolution of mammals. <laughs> That's right. You'll have to have to ask me in five years, right? Um, and so with that, I wanna thank so many people who have participated in this project who have um, helped, you know, bounce ideas off of. And, um, and then these folks at the bottom here in particular, I want to point out Ray Weldon and Marley Miller and Becky Dorsey and Dave Whistler, um, all of whom have really helped me manage the geology in the field. Um, you know, these are places that are structurally complex. There's faults and folds, and I've got to find my way around it to figure out where the fossils go. Um, and so I've worked with some great collaborators who've been um, really phenomenal about um, helping me figure out what I'm doing in the geology. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. I got a question back here. What's the abrasive in grass? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and it's not a question that we have a great answer to. Something, um, there's, there's kind of three, um, three strong candidates. Uh, one of them is that those phytoliths are actually those little bits of silica in the grass are the abrasive. Silica is harder than your tooth enamel. And so that's a reasonable inference. Some people don't like that answer, so that's all right. Um, second answer is grassy environments have more grit because the dust blows onto the grass because there's not you know trees to slow the wind down. Okay, so maybe it's just grit from the sediment. Okay, and then the third answer, and I don't like this one at all, is the fiber in the plants. So the, 
the plant fibers. Grass does have a lot more, you know, fibers in it and it's more fibrous in that way. And so the, the suggestion is it's just more abrasive because you're chewing all that fiber. And also because you have to chew more material to get any nutrition out of it because grass is, is, you know, not very nutritious plant material. So those are the three candidates. I don't know that there's a winner right now. I, I think you could find scientists who would, who would be on all three of those teams if you worked at it. So yeah, maybe it's all we love. We have a question from the chat. Okay. Yes, this comes from Charlie Montrose and hopefully my pronunciation is accurate. Where can a person get a copy of a 3D scan of Ceratogalus hachiri? There are people who would want to print out their own personal copy of the horned gopher. <laughs> a 3D scan of Ceratogalus hatcheri. Um, do I have such a thing? I don't know that I do. But if somebody wanted to email me, I can dig around and find out if there's one available on the interwebs. Um, it, probably someone has scanned one. I haven't. Um, I don't have one in my lab to scan right now, or I would use our fancy, fancy CT scanning facility to do it. Um, we just put in a new CT scanner on the new night campus down at UO, and I keep sending things over there and asking them to scan them for me. It's so exciting. But um, but yes, email me if you're if you're interested in a, a 3D model of Ceratogallus, and I'll let you know what I can find. Because you know, we've seen them before at the John Day when we did the John Day fossil beds a couple of summers ago. There are casts of them. Yes. So those are actual casts. Those are, um, I don't know, I think the molds have probably been destroyed entirely by now, but there are casts of Ceratogallus. Um, I have several of those, um, but I don't have a scan that I can share. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's probably a 3D scan of them somewhere. I just don't know where it is. Um, so I can, I can poke around and find out. Okay, so, thank you. Absolutely. There's a question up here, yeah. Seems like we have a lot of enthusiastic amateurs, you know, wandering around the back country, mm -hmm. you know, picking things up, yes. and, uh, you know, chipping away at rocks mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I'm wondering, is this uh, causing any problems? You know, actually, it um, it causes some solutions. Um, so uh, you saw all of that area of Oregon that I have not I have not yet you know got reported fossils from. Um, it turns out I can't cover all of it. Um, and so my approach to finding the fossils is not to just wander over the entire Oregon landscape hoping to trip over something. Um, I have really good connections with uh, the land managers and the BLM land, which owns a whole lot of that that area and with a, a bunch of amateur paleontologist groups. And then when people find things, they tell me about this, right? Um, so probably all of you as, you know, educated geological, uh, you know, um, uh, consumers know vertebrate fossils are protected on um, federal land and on state land, um, to some degree on state land. Um, and so if you find a vertebrate fossil, um, you can't just carry it off, um, but, if you take your, if you get really good information about where you are and then you go find a paleontologist, um, we are deeply appreciative. And, um, you know, we'll take note of who who told us about it and we've put it in the records and all that kind of thing and, and have been known to name fossils after people and so forth. Um, the fact is that amateur paleontologists, you know, folks who are out there fossil hunting find more of these things than I ever will. Um, and, you know, we've had some of the folks um, you know, come out sometimes and see the excavations and uh, and sometimes take part. I actually worked this June with a group uh, from Friends of the Hawaii to collect a mastodon femur that one of their um, one of their members had found. And it was super fun. It was a great group of uh, field hands. And the, at the end of it, you know, we spent three days digging this thing out and then we carried the sucker out to the um, to the road and it was a lot of fun. So, yeah. Where was that? That was out in Hawaii, so way out near uh, south of Vail. Um, so, um, yeah, middle of nowhere. <laughs> Question from Wesley Mayhem. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Kit, is my, is my audio okay? It's very loud as always, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll talk softly. Um, I, I really, I'm not a scientist. In fact, 50 years ago, my degree was in theology, but your talk tonight has been amazing in that it shows me the integration 
this is not all this is not just geology it's an integration of, of, of so many different sciences you know geography botany, biology and and your talk has just shown me and amazed me at how how interdependent all these different sciences are to explain this history so i just maybe i don't have a question i just want to thank you for this talk it was it was amazing Thank you, Wesley. I appreciate that. And, and I think paleontology is a discipline that really requires that integration. I think most of us are, are to some degree, jack of all trades and master of none, right? I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, if I have a, a parlor trick, it's identifying bones, right? But otherwise, I know a little bit about a whole bunch of different areas of geology because this kind of project requires that. And then I have great collaborators, right? And so a lot of it is just finding people to work with so I can handle the interdisciplinarity of what we're doing. But anyway, I'm glad that came through. Yeah, back here, Larry. So on your, uh, uh, Orrin Gopher, mm -hmm. so we're all familiar with moles. So is that Orrin Gopher? Is, is there a trace fossil that at the burl that accommodates those horns that can be down here? So um, the horn gophers, which by the way, aren't gophers. They're not at all closely related to gophers. They're related to mountain beavers, which are native to the Northwest. But anyway, um, there oh. is a right. Yeah, I know, right? So the boomers are Suwalel. Yeah, exactly. It's a, they're, they're locals, man. Um, so uh, there are a few records of burrows of these guys. Unfortunately, they're not of the ones with horns. So some of these, um, some of the relatives of Ceratogallus, the one with the horns, didn't have any horns, but otherwise, you know, had the big claws and the, you know, dug the holes and all that kind of thing. We have records of the burrows of the, the ones without horns. I don't know of any burrows of the horned ones. The horned ones are, are relatively uncommon. Um, there's only a few places where they occur. Um, and when they're there, they're not the most, even the most common of that group. So the, the group is called mylogallids. Um, and you'll usually get a bunch of the ones that don't have any horns and then a few specimens of the horned ones. Um, and you know, one of the things, so I showed you the picture of Ted Fremd with his, his beloved entelodont jaw earlier. Um, one of the things Ted and I went back and forth on was um, we have mylogallids very abundant in the record in Oregon, um, including some that have teeth that look kind of like the teeth of the ones with horns. But all of the skulls we have from Oregon don't have any horns. And so Ted was like, I bet these teeth are from one that had horns. And I was like, I mean, maybe. But like, maybe not, you know, maybe it just had teeth like that. And, it was, and he's like, the ones with horns are here. They were totally here. And so I was like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not willing to commit to that or whatever. And so when he made the displays at John Day Fossil Beds, he put in the ones with the horns. And I was like, okay, fair, you know, right? Like, sure, you know, go to, I mean, I want him to be there too. Um, and and uh, I suspect that those teeth probably were for some ones from horns. So one of these days, I'm going to do a giant happy dance because I'm going to find the, the skull of the, the horned ones. And it'd be great to find them with a burrow. Um, I did write a paper about how the horns work and where they fit in the great scheme of things. Um, the short answer is there's no way you can make them work as part of digging the burrow. Um, the horns are too far back in the skull. Um, and so they seem to have been a defensive adaptation, sort of like on, you know, horned lizards, right? They use them to spike things that, you know, um, that try and grab them. Um, but that's a, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> it's a long argument. What do we got? We have a question from Carrie Gordon. Okay. Carrie, do you want to unmute? If not, I can read her question. Mute. <laughs> Actually, Samantha, great talk. Thank you so much. You. Uh, one of the things that I've learned as a geologist here in Central Oregon is that I've worked a lot with rangeland folk and they know a ton about uh, Eastern Oregon and Central Oregon grasses and their nutrition mm -hmm. and silica content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you go up the road and talk to the OSU range group. Uh, I can bet that Carlos and folks, John Buckhouse, would have some uh, amazing data to be able to share with you. Because uh, I think you're right on with the silica content. It's not a fiber thing, at least according to all of the rangeland folks that I've, I've worked with. 
Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then the, Oh, go ahead. Oh, and then actually the other the other thought that I had, and it's and I think you already launched into this, but as a geologist for the Forest Service, I found that most of the archaeologists that I've worked with over the years with BLM and the Forest Service are de facto paleontologists because there's not a geologist on on nope. board. That's right. <laughs> yes. And uh, John Sankinell, a retired BLM archaeologist. Oh, I you do. John. You know Zank. Oh yes, okay. I've done a lot of field work with Zank. He's a great guy. Uh, okay, <laughs> but yeah, I have too. So all right, never mind. You've you already <laughs> made the connections because those are the folks that I have found the uh, been the most uh, interesting and getting me out there to look at the vertebrate fossils that are in the Ochoco Mountains and mm -hmm. grass. So thanks much, and I'm going to keep my eyes open a lot more. Please do. You can find me on the internet if you find something I want to know. <laughs> uh, when long, long ago, when I was a graduate, undergraduate, student, graduate student, I worked my way through electron microscope lab to pay my way. Mm -hmm. We looked at we looked at phytoliths. Uh, grasses grow phytoliths to protect themselves from insect attack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, dust on a, on, a, on a plant won't do the same damage to an insect as a phytolith on the surface. Uh, it, they, they, they be, so you go back to uh, last century, um, in effect, people looked at the phytoliths and how it, it attacked uh, insect jaws and, mm -hmm. and affected their uh, mandibles and their digestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that'll help support the use of phytoliths to uh, chew down, uh, wear down uh, dental mm -hmm. uh, teeth. Yeah, I mean all of the above, right? You know, I think um, I think there's been a lot of um, arguments made and, and studies done of, of both, right? So um, I knew a guy at Wyoming who was um, like he would take the hay they were going to feed the the ag the the sh like sheep in the ag school, and he would like dust it right he would like cover it in extra grit and then feed it to the sheep and see if it increased the dental abrasion and stuff there's been all these studies and, and i think most of what we learned from it is probably that all of it matters right um and so you can make a case for any of it and, and it's it's not too hard to find a study that supports any point of view on that and i think that probably means that they're all right you know I got a question in the back back there oh, yeah you uh, what was the name of your colleague who um, first harvested information from the silicone plant? So phytoliths, um, as as Charlie mentioned, um, you know, people have been doing work on um, on plant silica um, for a long time. My colleague Carolyn Stromberg, yeah, she was looking at it in in vertebrate fossil deposits and in deep time. So until she got there, it was used mostly sort of like recent time and then maybe the last million years or so something like that and she was like i want to know what's going on 30 million years ago i'm taking it all the way back um and she did and, and ran into some really interesting problems along the way it turns out that when the when you can't just sort of assume the modern flora applies then like you got to change your assumptions about like what an individual shape would mean right um so it it uh it took a whole lot of work for her to get it to um to be able to do that um, but, uh, but I think it was just a really cool study. I think it's, you know, that really transformed our understanding of vegetation history, for sure. Kate Eli know. has a question. All right. Kate. Hi, good evening. Yes. Um, what age of sediments may we find the horned gophers? Um, they're in um, the Miocene period, so this is from about, the, the earliest ones we have are about 15 million years old, um, so they're um, in the middle of the Miocene period there, around the time grasslands start to get kind of common, and they have little horns, um, but the ones with the big, really impressive horns are late Miocene, so about 7 million years old, um, so there's this period of, you know, like what, 8 million years there, um, where these things evolve. And we actually have a, a, quite a diversity of, um, of different um, sort of horn shapes and so forth along the way. Um, you know, there's, they're all paired horns, but, um, yeah. but yeah. So is there any indication that they may be find, found in the Mackay Formation in Eastern Oregon? So we there's don't, we don't have them in the Mackay. Um, we do, um, 
we do have, let's see, just below that. Um, so just a little older, the Mackay is right at, I wanna say uh, 7 million basically. Um, but we have it in the stuff that's slightly older. So like seven and a half million, we have some in Oregon. Um, there's some deposits out in Eastern Oregon that are um, just a smidge older than the Mackay um, that do have mylogallids, these um, horned gophers. In there. And again, you know, we say horned gophers, many of them don't have horns or at least don't have bony horns, um, but uh, we sort of call mylogallids in general, we call horned gophers in a lot of cases. Question here, yeah. Yeah, you just touched on this maybe briefly in your lecture, so it's a little off topic, but um, you, a lot of the Eocene animals look like they belong in South America. And can you speak to, I, I on the top of my head, I can't remember when Pangea started to break up mm -hmm. and South America disconnected. Yeah, so the Eocene actually is as, as distinct as things are gonna get. So South America, um, in the Eocene was as isolated as Australia is um, now. So it had, by that point, it, it, right around the age of, so Pangaea starts to break up 250 million years ago. Um, the continents look pretty close to what they look like today by the end of the age of dinosaurs, around 70 million years ago, except that the Southern continents were a little better joined. So the um, uh, Africa and, um, Antarctica and um, Australia were kind of, if not in contact, they were they were a lot closer. There was, you know, probably some dispersal routes there. Um, Australia was separated by then, but not not real, not a real long way off. Um, and around that time, so around the time that the dinosaurs all died. Um, Antarctica separates from um, the southern continents, from the other southern continents. And so South America becomes an island right around then. Um, and so it has its own mammal fauna. That tells us something about the history of evolution of mammals because it has a really extensive marsupial fauna, some of which are actually ancestral to all of the marsupials in um, Australia. So there's this thing called the, what is the Montico del Monte um, that is like, the sister to all Australian marsupials um, that suggests that, you know, marsupials were previously sort of distributed around the southern continents pretty extensively. Um, and then Australia separated from everything else and radiated its own little marsupial fauna. And through the Eocene and actually most of the Cenozoic, uh, South America is doing its own thing just like Australia does. It's got a, a big marsupial fauna. It has some, um, some big ungulates that look kind of like horses, but are a totally separate lineage. There are these like horse-like ones, there's some camel-like ones that are not camels. Um, and the Northern continents have their own like big ungulate fauna. And then the other thing that South America gets going for it that's really wacky is that monkeys and rodents rafted over from Africa. I, I'm not kidding, we're talking like, like a bunch of fallen trees with some rats in it, like floated over from Africa and those rats, you know, starving and dying of thirst arrived on South America about 40 million years ago and founded lineages that are endemic to South America. So the, the um, New World monkeys, right? So like squirrel monkeys and, and things like that. Oh gosh, I'm gonna embarrass myself. I don't know primates worth a darn, okay? So, so you know, New World monkeys radiate capuchins and stuff like that uh, in South America from an ancestor that was North African um, that rafted over. And then, um, you know, you think about South American endemic rodents like capybaras and, um, guinea pigs and things like that. That whole group originated from another bunch of things that rafted over from Africa 40 million years ago when there was definitely not any contact between South America and Africa. And it's one of those stories that I tell my students like, no, really, they rode a bunch of like fallen trees across the ocean. And the so, students are like, no. So right? when they have like taper like things in North mm -hmm. America, and you know, you think of animals like that being in South America, was there some 
uh, parallel evolutionary tracks going on or how it? Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Yes, I can. So when they have like these tapir-like forms, when they have camel-like forms in North and South America, are these parallel evolutionary tracks, right? Um, and, and the answer is, um, yes, we actually see remarkable convergence between this lineage in South America, um, that is, you know, ungulates, and the ones in North America. You see things that look like camels in South America, and then camels evolve in North America. And actually, you know, we think about, you know, llamas and, and things like that in South America. They came from immigrants from North America that came in and replaced the native uh, South American lineages that had made camel-like things um, with actual camels and then camels went extinct in North America, right? So like it it gets biogeographically kind of complicated, right? Um, when you when you look at this. But but yeah, I mean you see the same kinds of forms evolving repeatedly, um, which tells you something about what ecologies work. It also tells you that looking at how habitat drives uh, evolution in these groups may not be totally wacky, right? It seems there seem to be some predictable relationships that arise. Right? Yeah. Charlie has another question. <laughs> No. Okay. No. Oh, no. He's got his hands up. All right. So can oh, you, I'm sorry. I, 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 it, yeah. It, it can you speak to what was happening in Africa at the same time? Around the same time? Harder to know. Um, we know some things about the Eocene of Africa. It's the there's a record. Um, the Fayum formation in Egypt is actually very well collected and very well described, um, and we see um, a lot of um, a lot of the roots of um, primate evolution, not only the monkeys that made it over to uh, South America, but the roots of a lot of the monkey lineages that are in the old world, right? So the um, Circopathicines, right? So okay. and things like that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of these um, primate lineages, and we learn a lot about that from the Eocene record in Africa at this time. Um, there's a lot of rodent diversity that had come in from um, you know, a few forms have gotten in from the northern continents and then evolved there in place in Africa. Unfortunately, we've kind of got a gap between that 40-ish million year old Fayum record um, and then, you know, in the sort of seven or eight million years ago period, there's been a whole lot of work on um, human origins, right? And so uh, work on Australopithecines, you know, all of the... Um, uh, you know, the work on Lucy and all those kinds of um, early forms, that kind of, there's a bunch of work that's picked up there, but um, for both geologic reasons and sort of history of um, mm -hmm. paleontological collecting reasons, kind of got a gap in between 40 and about 7 million years ago. There are a few faunas, there's not a huge number of them that are, that are really well known. And a lot of the work is really focused on primate evolution, um, because that is the cradle of primate evolution, right? Um, and so our knowledge of some of the other groups is maybe not as thorough, although there's been a lot of work recently to look at um, some of the associated groups because they pick up all the fossils when they, they're like, oh, here's some primates and I guess we'll sweep up all the rest of this stuff too, you know? And so then we end up with all these fossils in museums that many of which haven't been as much studied. Um, so there's a lot of information there. Um, and clearly it was a crossroads in a lot of ways, right? Because getting fauna from Europe and Asia, some of that was getting to South America, um, you know, some of that's going to other places. Um, and so there's a lot of active work going on there. There's been some really cool work in Turkey, sort of right at, in the place where things are going back and forth between um, Europe and, and Africa. Um, that's uh, that's showing us some cool things about mammal evolution and, and biogeography and, and exchanges between continents. So, um, so yeah, there's exciting ongoing work, and I'm sorry I can't tell you more about it. Um, part of that's my ignorance as somebody who works mostly with North American record, and then some of that's that it's work in progress. Yeah. So I have another question. Um, can you tell me where specifically in the Pacific Northwest mastodon remains were found? Um, there's a lot of them. The oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Um, so the question was where specifically in the Pacific Northwest mastodon remains were found. Um, so there's a lot of Pleistocene records, so relatively shallow time records of, of mastodons and their, their relatives. So um, there's been uh, work in the Willamette Valley. There's a lot of assemblages here. The Tualatin has a mastodon, right? So um, to the library in Tualatin. Yeah. Fantastic. yeah, totally. And there's a good display. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, so, uh, so that uh, the Willamette Valley has a lot of them in part because of the um, you know glacial outwash floods burying a bunch of um, you know things. The one that we collected actually is interesting because it's much older. It's uh, it's about fifteen million years old. Um, so it's you know order of magnitude older than the ones we're getting out of the Pleistocene here. So it's one of the first. I think it's a mastodon. It might be a gonfathere, but don't hold me to that. Um, one of the early elephant relatives to make it into North America because they don't get here until about 16 million, something like that. Um, and so this is one of the first records we have of, of elephant relatives in North America. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty neat. This is from uh, the, the eastern side of the Hawaii. Um, so, and, you know, greater specificity than that would not mean anything. Um, so, um, but yeah, so we, that was where we, um, we got the specimen that we collected um, this year. Um, we're still working on prepping it and putting it back together because some of the bits had fallen off and we're, we got our preparator sticking all the bits back together. <laughs> got another one online? Harold Hines has a question. Yeah, hi. Um, interesting talk. Um, I'm a bit skeptical because I like to know a lot more about your sample size and how that related to your drawing conclusions. The graphs look very convincing, but they're dependent on sample size. So, so which data uh, are you are you skeptical of? Sorry. Well, no, you're looking you're looking at these different tooth types, yes. and those are based on sample size in terms yes. of your graphs. Yes. And so talk a little more about the complexity and problems of sample size and drawing your conclusions. This is why I love rodents. They don't come in small numbers. They come in really large numbers. Um, so when I'm drawing conclusions, so for example, when I put up that graph of, um, you know, rodent um, crown height, you know, through time, I had my little marmot on one side and then I had the, the crown heights in rodents on the, on the other side. Um, we're talking about literally tens of thousands of teeth involved there. So that's based on a survey of the entire North American record, um, every published specimen and a whole bunch of not published specimens of, of these guys. And so, um, so that one's a pretty good sized uh, sample. The, the one with the ungulate teeth from 2000, which is not my study, that was Christine Janice's work, uh, is based on still several hundred teeth um, for, for that. Um, paleoecologists in general um, tend to be uh, careful about our sample size, and it means we often can't ask the question that we want, right? Because you know sometimes you gotta you gotta find the right place and the right time and the right question um, in order to be able to put together enough fossils to actually answer it. Um, but it's a good one to ask, um, and. Uh, and it's important for us to think about always how well are we sampling these things. And that's why I'm working out in, in Eastern Oregon is trying to build the samples to ask more detailed questions about um, the evolution of locomotor types and so forth, right? Those, those two pretty color graphs that I put up there at the end um, are ones that are based on samples I'm not 100% convinced by yet. Um, and so those are, you know, smaller numbers and, and in some cases, you know, a specimen of a particular locomotor type that, um, you know, I'd like to have more, more data. And that's why I'm out there screen washing dirt every year. We have one more question on the chat. Gary okay. Joe Quinn mm -hmm. has a question. Sure. Yeah, let me, uh, I might have to reframe it a couple of ways. It's pretty broad. Uh, and I, it may turn out to just be comic relief. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can usually use that. Uh, first of all, I, I'm a neophyte at geology, and I know even less about paleontology. Sweet. Uh, it reminds me of my uh, honeymoon in France, where I had a chance to use my uh, high school French and frequently got myself in trouble with the natives because they assumed that I could communicate at a faster rate than I was capable of. So oh, I was... Yeah. So I was always asking them initially, uh, parlez-vous anglais? And y uh, a-t-il une autre personne ici qui parle anglais? Is there someone else here who speaks a language? Uh, and then once I'd established that I was an idiot, we got along great. Yes. Uh, you showed earlier in your presentation some graphs that illustrated a decline in genera as the climate cooled and forests transitioned to grasslands. Intuitively, I wanted to complete the graph and fill in the data from 5 million years ago to the present day. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see what the current number of genera in North America were today. 
Uh, this suggests the question, are you or any of your colleagues trying to predict the future? And if so, what disciplines would be involved in trying to answer a question like that? So um, dangerously, yes, we are engaged in trying to predict the future a little bit. Um, you know, I actually got into this. I was talking to people uh, over dinner about, you know, where I came from on this. I actually started out um, as a biology major. I was totally a crunchy granola hippie going to save the world conservation biologist. And um, I came into paleontology not as a childhood dinosaur geek, but as a, a, a hippie who wanted to save the world. And why, you gotta, you gotta ask, why does a hippie who wants to save the world go into paleontology? It's already all dead, right? And the answer is um, that in order to see the future, we have to see where we've been, right? And so right now we are engaged in some changes to global ecosystems that we can't just compare to like written history, right? We're getting well out of written history territory already. But you saw that climate graph. We're not outside of the realm of what the fossil record has experienced. It has been this warm before, okay? It was really different and there weren't people in it and the plants were super different and it didn't necessarily warm up this fast, okay? It has a few times warmed up this fast before and the, the answer has been seriously bad news, right? Um, so, but if we're gonna understand what we're doing and if we're gonna make forecasts for what might happen in the future, it sure helped to understand what's happened in the past with this, okay? So part of what's got me motivated to work on these questions of how habitat and mammals are related is that we're altering habitats at, a, at an unprecedented pace right now, right? We are, we are changing it all. We're changing the connectedness of habitats. We're creating the barriers to migration, okay? We're also um, changing the diversity of habitats. We're reducing the diversity of habitats pretty dramatically, right? We're doing all of these things ourselves. And I'm curious what's happened when this has happened in the past, okay? Will it be the same? No, no, it won't, okay? No, because there are people on it and there are roads on it and there's a bunch of stuff going on that, that wasn't going on in the past. But can we understand something about how these processes look? Can we get a sense of maybe what it would look like if things were going in one direction or another, maybe, okay? And so that's my hope eventually. So ask me that in 20 years, right? Maybe I'll start forecasting the future, but I've, I've been at this for 15 years at the U of O so far. And you know, if you count my time in graduate school, I've been working on these kinds of problems for over 20 years. And I'm not ready to answer that one yet. So right? you, you just said that this uh, rapid rise of heat that we're experiencing now has happened a couple of other times and it wasn't, Good news. Yes. When was that? So, how do you know it? So the question was, um, you know, I just said that the the rise in temperature, the kind of rapid rise in temperature we're seeing today, has happened in the past. When was that? And 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 what happened? What you know? What does it look like? So there was a point in the Eocene. Let me see if I can find. It's actually you can see it in my slides, and I can share my screen again here, so that the rest of you can see it too. There. Okay, so there's a point in um, at the Paleocene Eocene boundary here that you can see where um, it's called the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. So temperatures just go totally through the roof and they do this probably in the order of decades. Okay, when we look at the record, the narrower we get, it's still just really rapid. And it's a spike, as you can see there, of something like two to four degrees Celsius which should sound familiar because that's what um, we're talking about right now for sort of forecast climate change um, due to, to human activity. Um, it seems to have been a result of runaway global warming that resulted from uh, basically reorganization of the deep, deep ocean that liberated a bunch of, um, of methane that was deep in the ocean. Methane, of course, is a really powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and um, the reason that it occurs at this boundary between this time called the Paleocene and the time called the Eocene um, is that these time boundaries are set based on major faunal changes. So huge faunal change responded to that. We also see um, in the short term, 
we see dwarfing in a lot of these uh, lineages. So individual species you'll see like over decades um, become, not decades, over hundreds of years become smaller, right? So body size is smaller in really warm habitats. This is entirely surprising, right? Smaller things can shed heat better than bigger things, right? Um, so we see some sort of local effects and then we see uh, evolution in a variety of, of lineages. So that's one of the times, there's a couple others. That one's the one that people have really hit because there's a great record of it in a place called um, the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. Um, so there's some really good studies of that, but that's another of the cases of times where we're using that to try and infer some of the things that might help us understand what's going on now. So would you expect ultimately the result of what's going on now to create a more um, equatorial kind of climate with more moisture? I mean, is that so question is, well, I expect to see what's going on now to create a more equatorial climate with more uh, sort of warmth and moisture. Um, ask the climate modelers that one, um, maybe. Um, it, one of the challenges is that it creates uh, sort of climate compression. So you don't get um, everything uh, warming equally. You actually get uh, relatively little warming at the equator because you know you warm things much more and the, the evaporation of water basically sort of mitigates the heating. But at the poles, you get massive changes in temperature, right? Because there's melting ice, you get phase transition in water, and we all know that water is kind of nasty that way, right? Um, and so what you get is a smaller difference between the temperature at the equator and the temperatures at the poles. So the farther north you go, the bigger the effects are likely to be in general when you warm the globe as a whole. But it's complicated. Um, and, you know, atmospheric circulation patterns change. And so that means some places get colder and some places get warmer and it's just all kind of screwy. This is so hard to do. The climate modelers work with the gnarliest computers you can find and they can just barely almost get like, you know, a few days to run. And then they're like, yeah, you know, you poke this thing and you get a totally different answer. It's a really big complex system, but it's a great question when we're really poking at. One last question from the chat. Chris Allman has a question. Chris? Oh, um, hey, I, I have a question that um, is related to the person who asked questions a, a little bit ago. Um, it, 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 I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm getting yeah, I'll feedback. Um, so this has to do with um, how soup, the super volcano eruptions um, in Yellowstone may have caused some microclimates that added to um, extinction, loss of biodiversity, um, you know, and maybe somewhat related to how we view everything in the context of uh, evolutionary pressures on biodiversity uh, right now. Um, so, you know, how much can the atmospheric pressures be related to um, what we see with biodiversity in the Pacific Northwest related to the super volcanoes? And the, the, the other question that I know you wouldn't be able to answer as, as it relates to what your studies are, but more um, to what degree may epigenetics be playing a role in, in, in terms of how species are going to survive or not with all these evolutionary pressures that are occurring right now because of climate change? All right, I'm going to be totally chicken hearted and bail on epigenetics. Um, I'm, I'm, there, there are definitely people who can answer that question. Uh, and I'm not one of them. Um, so I'm gonna chicken out of that one uh, and say that people who know more about genetics than I do uh, could probably help with that, that question. Um, as to super volcanoes and that kind of thing, um, you know, one of the projects that I've had um, going in the lab is actually trying to work out the different effect that volcanics have on, um, on mammals. We had a, um, a student who did a thesis on the relationships between volcanic eruptions and mammal evolution. Uh, and he completed his thesis and then got a job as the head paleontologist at John Day, and that's Nick Famoso. So um, he's he seems to do all right. Um, and uh, so he's like the man to talk to on this front. But um, you know, in short, the the sort of preliminary study that he did on it um, showed 
that there seem to be some effects of these big volcanic eruptions, in particular on mammals, in a way that we don't see uh, in the smaller eruptions that people have actually observed. So we have some data around, for example, Mount St. Helens. I know it's kind of creepy to call that a smaller eruption, but it's a whole lot smaller than what we're talking about with the supervolcanoes. Um, Mount St. Helens didn't have a major effect on the mammalian fauna. The gophers actually kind of dug up through the ash a few weeks later and they're like, eh, dang, that's messy, you know, um, and like just went back and doing what they were doing, you know, but um, the, the supervolcano eruptions have a big enough field that we would expect they might actually sort of you know, wipe out a good sized chunk of, uh, of the fauna. And so Nick looked at one of those as, uh, as part of his work, there's a, there's a unit in the middle of the John Day formation called the Picture Gorge Ignimbrite. And if you go out there and you look at sheep rock from the visitor center, um, about halfway up sheep rock, there's this big orange thing in the middle of all the green. And that's the Picture Gorge Ignimbrite. And an Ignimbrite is basically a giant cloud of flaming death that comes out of a volcano. Um, the Picture Gorge Ignimbrite, we see all the way from John Day, from Dayville, um, down to um, Polina. So near Polina, there's some of the, the eruptive products of this. So, you know, like a sixth of the state of Oregon was probably, you know, covered in various bits of the, the um, this um, ash flow. So big eruption then, and Nick was looking at what the fauna did before and after it, because the John Day record preserves both, which is great. Unfortunately for Nick, that eruption coincides with a major episode of faunal turnover like across North America. And we can't say that that's driven by one volcanic eruption in the Northwest because it happens in Florida too, right? So clearly like something reorganized in the fauna. We don't entirely know why, um, but unfortunately it hit the same time period as that eruption. So there's a big faunal change, but we can't say it was because of the eruption because you know, across the, the continent, we're getting a big faunal change. So uh, that one was a little disappointing, but um, that's it's a it's a question we're still working on. Uh, intuitively, it makes sense that volcanics should have an important impact on the fauna. Um, it looks like it's kind of a subtle one because we see a lot of volcanic eruptions in the record that don't necessarily have an impact on the fauna directly. Um, it's more likely that <clears throat> areas with frequent volcanic eruptions like we have, you know, for example, here in Oregon, um, you get changes in the sediment character and the habitats that are a result of the fact that ash is just there all the time and never really entirely goes away, right? And so um, you get some, what we call pseudo aridity, for example, in um, habitats that are heavily impacted by volcanoes um, that you don't get elsewhere. And so it seems to have some effects. It may also be uh, important in the grit that things experience with their teeth, right? So the volcanic eruptions put ash all over the plants and then everything that eats the ash. It's more abrasion for their teeth. And so we see some changes in the way they eat that seem to, to reflect that, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I 